complex stress. So his hypothesis was that because you already have some sort of phenotypic plasticity, that is, you can already have the callosity because of stress, then by mean of random mutation and selection, you will canalize, you will funnel that phenotype into something that is um, then uh, adapted to the environment. So we have adaptive evolution that will create an embryo mechanism that create that callosity. Um, and so then, you know, many of you probably wondered then why is there a controversy? He said, what is the controversy? What is the controversy? So the common view of um, evolution is that you have random mutation in a population that will generate um, a trait, and that trait in an environment has a fitness and will be selected, right? But if you take phenotypic plasticity, it's actually hard to apply those sort of model because then you have multiple environments with multiple traits, and the same genotype will have multiple traits, multiple fitness in those environments. And so people argue that phenotypic plasticity can be a driver to adaptive evolution, like what Inton just said, where you have phenotypic plasticity, you're going to be able to drive adaptive evolution and create new traits, new complex traits. But another side argued that phenotypic plasticity represses um, uh, adaptive evolution. Indeed, if you take the example of um, a, a species that is able to go into multiple environments, and because of phenotypic plasticity, it can invade a lot of niches. Overall, that, that, that species will, will try to maintain that plasticity because it allows it to be in multiple environments, more food source, more, um, uh, less, maybe less predation because of that. So there's like multiple events that can um, push evolution to actually maintain phenotypic plasticity, and thus repressing adaptive evolution on that trait that is plastic, right? And so, in October this year, um, some researcher touches on that topic again in that paper called The Developmental Plasticity and the Origin of Tetrapod. It was published in Nature by Stendhal, Trine, and Larson. And so, uh, in that paper, they try to study um, how does developmental plasticity lead through adaptive evolution to the evolution of tetrapod. So at the beginning, there was a gigantic ball of fire that you will see really well on the screen. But that ball of fire filled with water because of meteor, and maybe Rosetta will prove that soon. Um, and in that water, microorganisms started to produce oxygen. So the air, at the atmosphere of Earth, was starting to be filled with oxygen. And because of that, some fish that were living in shallow pond of water were able to develop blood. And that lung allowed them to actually catch oxygen out of those ponds that sometimes, for some reason, may be depleted in oxygen. And because of that, they started to actually walk. And by walking, they became tetrapods. Right? So that's the common view of evolution of the tetrapods. So in the paper, the author used a fish called Polypterus. So Polypterus is a good proxy for that moment of evolution. Because that moment of evolution, as you spoke about, what happened 400 million years ago, uh, before the evolution of silicon lungfish and asthenopterans and the tetrapods. So Polypterus is that clade of fish that is the racing fish, um, and it is supposed to be the, a member that will have existed at the, mom, at the time of uh, the tetrapod evolution and the land invasion of animals. So the main thing that made Polypterus very interesting for the author to study is that it is the fish that can walk. So if you take a little fish, it's happy in its pond and water. And well, for some reason, there's no more food there at all. And so it has to eat something. So Polytherus is actually able to walk out of the water on land to another pond and then get another food source. And that is what made that fish very interesting. So the author decided to take 150 fish that they bought at 70 days old and they decided to raise about 100 on land, so they only put them on land, no water, and 50 in water. And using those two groups of fish, they will look at the phenotypic plasticity of those fish that is induced by being on land or being on water. Um, and so the first, so their experimental setup was that they took fish uh, for, for, the, for their first experiment, the experimental setup. But that they took some fish from the land-raised land group and the water group, 
And they put them in a room with cameras, and they looked at the motion and the kinematics of the fish. So how does the fish walk, right? And is there a difference in between a fish that is raised on water and a fish that is uh, raised on land? And so the first thing is that they looked at the motion. So Polypterus has a very peculiar way of walking. Uh, I'm not even sure we can call that walking. It's more crawling. So it starts by pushing its weight on one fin, right? So it, it, it completely shifts its weight on one fin, which allows them to raise its body and nose and head, and then thrust with its tail. It's going to push, so it's going to be able to move forward and, and kind of like slide in front of them. Um, and then it's going to repeat the same movement on the other side, right? And so using their high-speed cameras, they looked at the motion and kinematics and the differences of the water versus land-raised fish. And so what they found was that the, out of all the parameters they looked at, the, the significant one were the fin elevation, that is when you go and you move your fin to grab the next attachment point, right? Um, how much do you actually move your fin? Like, do you actually do like a crazy move like that, or you just like move it a little bit? Uh, so the fin elevation in the land-raised fish was a lot reduced, so that they use a lot less energy to actually go to the next point, because they make less movement. Um, the th second thing they looked at was the fin, stride dis the fin slide distance and the fin, fin slide duration. So Polyteris is still a fish, so it tries to walk, but it has fins, and fins are not clothes, or not like feet or hands. So when you want to walk on land, you actually slide a lot, it's, it's gliding. So uh, the land-raised fish had a fin slide distance that was greatly reduced compared to the water-raised uh, fish. And the fin slide duration was also greatly reduced. So that they learned how to manage their sliding, their like slimy fin on the floor. They, they managed to actually evolve, like learn some behavior that allowed them to reduce their to slide. And thus be a lot more efficient in the friction and be more efficient to move forward. And moreover, they also look at the fin distance to the body. That where does the fin actually, like, where does the fish put its fin? And they, they show that it's a lot closer to the body, allowing the fish to raise its body a lot uh, more so that it can thrust itself a lot further, right? Because if you have more elevation to start with, when you're actually going to push, you're going to go further. And finally, the stroke duration, that is the time it takes the fish to actually do like a whole movement, was also greatly reduced. And so, uh, overall, they showed that there is plasticity, phenotypy, uh, uh, phenotypy plasticity in the um, walking behavior of the fish, and that there is improvement in how the fish walks that allows the fish to move more efficiently, spend less energy, and very likely be more adap adapted to walking on land. So the second thing they looked at was the morphological changes. So, um, Bear with me here, because it's a lot of anatomy, and I wasn't a specialist, and I'm still not. Um, but I try to color code everything uh, so that it's easier. So the fish anatomy of... So the fish anatomy uh, is made as such, so at least for the pectoral part of the fin. So you have the skull uh, that is attached to the supraclatrum, and that bone is what attaches the skull to the claytrum and the clavicle, right? So the claytrum and the clavicle are the bone that allows the fin to move and to move in a lot of direction. And the supraclatrum is the one that attaches it to the bone, to the skull, uh, with, att attaches the skull to the bone. And so they compared the water-raised and the land-raised fish, and they tried to, to look at morphological differences using micro -CT. So they took those fish, they put them into micro -CT. And micro CT allows you to extract the volume, the density, uh, the size. It, it allows you to recreate 3D bones and the bone structure of, of those fish. And that allows you to actually then compare statistical differences in between those bone structures. Is there more, uh, is a bone more dense, is a bone more long or narrow, everything. So when they did that and they look at the plasticity induced by being raised on land, what they found was four main points. The first one is the loosened supraclatrum, right? So in the water, 
or its fish compared to the land release fish, what you can see here is that the superarchaeum is more loosely attached to the skull. And why is that important is that if you're in water, uh, it doesn't matter if your fin are attached to your skull because you don't need to move your head to eat um, in any other way than by just swimming, right? So it doesn't matter, but when you're on land, you need to be able to move your head independently of your fins. So by having a loosened superarchaeum, super the fish is able to eat more or eat more easily on land, right? Because it can move its head without moving its fin. And the second uh, point is that um, B, C, and D are that there is the narrower clatrum and longer clatrum, and as well as a flatter and larger clavicle. And so those three points um, allow more um, amplitude of movement for the clatrum, which is elongated, so it's like more amplitude of movement on the fi of, of the fin. And the clavicle that is flatter and larger allows the fish to have more um, freedom of movement in the different angles and direction that it wants to bridge. So overall, the fish anatomical structure changed when it was raised on land compared to water. And the author proposed that the continuous stress that was imposed on the fish is what it was the driver of, of, of that uh, difference in morphology. And I mean, it makes sense. Uh, and you may wonder and know why did I present that paper? Because they took some fish, they raised them in land, and well, they see behavioral changes and bone structure changes due to gravity and stress. And that's nothing really new. So is it worse to enter Florian's angle nature collection paper? Maybe. Uh, I'll let you judge of that. Choose a weird, weird species and study it and make a nature paper. Um, <laughs> So, but actually, what I think was interesting in that paper, and the reason why I chose to present it, was that the bone, stru the bone structure changes that they see, the morphological changes that they see, um, are what recapitulate what we know of fossil evolution of the tetrapods. So when you take fossil records, and you look at their bone structure, and you look at the evolution of the bones, um, what you see is that they have from the fish to the tetrapods, they have a loosened superatrium and a narrower picture and a longer picture and a larger and flatter clavicle. So all of that is actually what you see when you look at the fossil evolution of the tetrapods. And that is why then it becomes interesting, uh, why this, this paper becomes interesting, because in just one generation, not even in one generation, the same generation, just by having some plasticity in the phenotype of that fish, it develops similar be like similar changes to what was seen millions of years ago of evolution. And so because of that, the author proposed the tetrapod evolution theory, I mean their tetrapod evolution theory, which is that you start 400 million years ago with some shallow pond of water. It's 400 million years ago. And then you have some, uh, you have that fish that can walk on land and reach some different form. And its reaction norm that is like, it's, it's, its phenotype according to the environment is that it's more adapted to water, but it can still reach land, right? Even if it's not as good. Then what happens is that because of some environmental change, the water disappears. And so that fish is forced to walk on land all the time, and it's walk to evolve on land. So because the water disappeared, and because of phenotypic plasticity, that fish will be able to change its phenotype, and that because there's no more water, its walking behavior, for example, will be more driven towards land, right? And it's gonna shift slightly toward land. And then, after millions of years of evolution, and by means of genetic assimilation, what will probably happen is that you're gonna have selection for the land-based traits. Right? And so fish will genetically assimilate what they had as, as plastic phenotype, and they won't be plastic anymore. They will only be able to walk on land. And then at that time, what you have is a tetrapod. It's not a fish anymore. And so with that, I would like to conclude 
by recapitulating the paper and saying that so polyterus, when raised on land, expresses phenotypic plasticity, which in itself is an interesting result. And it, it expresses gait improvement um, as well as bone morphology changes. The interesting part and the impact of the paper is that the morphological changes recapitulate some of the features that were seen in the, in the evolution of the tetrapod fossil record. But at the same time, one of the big points that I, like the big critique that I have for that paper is that um, the multiple, it lacks a multiple generation set. It's like there is no, there is nothing here that actually shows that those, um, that phenotypic plasticity is what actually drove evolution and adaptive evolution, right? Adaptive evolution. So that there is no multiple generation study when you see that well, the more you go and the more actually you're gaining those phenotypes which are land based. And there's no genomic analysis for the underlying plasticity, right? So we actually don't know what drives that like plasticity. I mean, we may know in other species, but in that case of that fish, we don't actually know. So overall, that paper is interesting, and I think it has some, it makes some very interesting point. Um, but on the controversy debate, it doesn't actually bring anything because I mean, it doesn't explain, it doesn't show if yes or no, it's going to drive adaptive evolution and or will it represses it. There is actually no study on that controversy, even if that's a bit what they claim at the beginning by saying that yes, it drives adaptive evolution. Um, I don't think they show, but they show still some very interesting things. And on that, I would like to thank you and thanks my coach Andrew and Ethan for their support. The land question, the land raised, uh, were there like little ponds or puddles, or were they just like exclusively on land? No, so what they did is that they raised them on a um, surface that is um, kind of like uh, mimics the ground, but it's not actually actual land, it's a plastic surface. And so they also added little rocks, and what they had was humidifiers. There was no pond, there was just humidifiers that the fish don't die. That the fish was humidified. All right. Well, I'll ask that one later. Did they look at all the ability of the land raised fish to swim, right? Because they compared the ability of both of them to walk on the Yeah. So I didn't have the time to talk about it, but yeah. So they, they are all, the, like, at the same time, they were comparing all the morphological changes and behavioral changes of the, of the swimming versus walking. Uh, they also looked at the swimming behavior. And what they show is that there is no difference at all in between the land raised fish or the swimming, uh, the water raised fish. You have to raise them so that you so actually, yeah. yeah, it's 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 because of the fact that they spent eight months walking on land and that they were raised that way that they express those phenotypic uh, differences. Otherwise, they don't. Yes, because they have lung. Oh, sorry, maybe I forgot. Breathe. A breathe. Ah, breathe. <laughs> <laughs> breathe will uh, Can they breathe? So uh, the, the other, so so I, I actually looked that up because that was actually a question I was wondering: is that can they actually breathe with water? And the author did not mention it at all. And I looked up on Google and I couldn't find anything that will actually said they could breathe without water because it's kind of the first time that someone take a blister and raise it on land only. I assume the answer is going to be yeah. Yeah. Well, the, like at the same time, some frog, for example, can also spawn on water or in, in land, and with like their eggs and like so, or like humid, like humid places. Yeah. So maybe if you have humid places, I, I don't know. I'm just uh, there is no answer. I bet they could do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just get an intertidal zone with enough mud. I think they could do it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Andrew. So do they say anything about how much variation there is in the phenotypes of animals raised on land and in water? In other words, do the two distributions overlap or are they quite distinct? On when they do these measurements. Which phenotype? 
Well, for, for the, any of the morphological phenotypes or the yeah. movement phenotypes, so, are they two distributions that largely overlap or are they quite separate? Yeah, so, so for, for the walking behavior, um, all the ones that I explained are the ones that are very statistically significant. So those ones do not overlap at all. They're, they're really, really strong differences. For the morphological differences, um, they have differences in between 5 to 10, 11 percent in, in length and narrow. Um, so like it's, it's, it's not huge. It's, it's in between 5 and 10 percent. So that it does overlap, I would say, but it's statistically significant with whatever yeah, that means. I mean, it's like we all know that that test means sometimes. Uh, Morphology, but their bones are different, so therefore they move different, and it's not necessarily a completely mm. separate thing. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, they don't discuss that, and I think it's true. I mean, well, they discuss it a little bit by, by saying that um, the, more, the morphological changes that they see, they try to explain how that will allow the, the fish to move more freely, and so, so that may be the case, but at the same time, um, what happened in the fish is that it actually moves less when it's walking. So that yes, it moves more freely with its morphological changes, but what they measure is that it actually moves less and is more efficient in the walking behavior. But they don't record, or maybe they record it, but they don't talk about other behaviors, like eating or like um, hunting kind of, or like stuff like that. They don't actually look at it, but maybe in that case, being raised on land will actually have an advantage. So, my, just one last thing. When you have, so did they do anything to to like kind of untangle whether the morphological changes were really just gravity or like stress from going on land, or whether it was like an actual adaptive change? No, they don't. Uh, they don't. And that will be an interesting thing to do, but I'm not sure you. But that's kind of like the genetic, you know, like that I proposed at the end. Like, like, what are the? Is there some genetic mechanism? Actually, underlying that, or is it just gravity stress or like friction stress? Yes. Um, is this model um, really that different from a scenario where you have static phenotypes and you just have like a uh, distribution of phenotypes across the population? Does it change the, the model at the end at all? <sighs> well, I mean, we always have a distribution of phenotypes, and you have a range of phenotypes, right? What what is interesting here is not actually the the range of the phenotype themselves, because that is controlled by the fact that you have over 100 fish and land and 50, so you have good enough number to actually have some statistics there. Uh, what is interesting is that you have changes in changes in the phenotype that are induced by the environment, so that you have some sort of a constraint by the environment towards one phenotype. Uh, more than the fact that the underlying variation of phenotype drives that. that thing. I don't think it. I mean, yeah. I was just wondering if it changes like the evolutionary model much. The fact that it changes. Well, yeah. I mean, that's kind of like the controversy of the like, plasticity is that if you change too much and if you adapt to too much environment, then that it's actually hard to know. Will you, you know, like select for that? Phenotypic plasticity, that is like each you know, individual will have different traits. And that's your question? Not sure. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, sort of going off of that, um, so what was the author's answer? Just like which part of the contract or which uh, what, they take? So what, what the author says is that it drives adaptive evolution. Uh, because what they say is that because they see those morphological changes that recapitulate what we see in fossil evolution. <laughs> Uh, they say that phenotypic plasticity was the driver of adaptive evolution of the right? That's, that's, that's their conclusion. And I think it's an overreaching conclusion, personally. Uh, yes. uh, did, for one individual fish, did they show that they were Um, so they only provide the mean and navigation number and the paper. They don't. I don't have the whole table of all species, so I don't know. But uh, the mean and navigation is like the, the, the population is what they study. Last question. Uh, 
Uh, so let me uh, draw out the point that the behavior could be what well, we observe as behavior could be a result of technological changes. <coughs> but from a motor learning perspective, it could be the other way around, uh, where the fact that they constantly have to move on land induces these technological changes. I mean, we see this even in human populations. Mm -hmm. People who grow up playing yeah. certain kinds of sport all the time usually end up having to no, I agree. I mean, and that, that's kind of what is proposed here, is that the fact that they have to walk on land is what induces morphological changes, right? Is that, uh, like, if you have a human that, I don't know, uh, since is like five years old, uses its right arm, like most of us do, right? We have a lot more muscle in the right arm that we have on the left arm. But if you're left, if you're using your left arm more, then you have more muscle there, right? So that's like, it, it's kind of like the, the fact that they, Behaviorally, because they are forced to actually walk more on land, and they will adapt and change their behavior, that will stress the bone structure and create that differences in the bone, is the theory that they have. I don't think it's a, it's a discussion on all of that, that was a good question. Um, did they, I, I don't think they did this in the paper, but it seems like it would be interesting to look if there was also a preference. Um, so the ones that were uh, grew up in a more terrestrial habitat, then preferred to be in a more terrestrial habitat. Yeah. And in that sense, it's then a little bit easier to make the next Yeah, leap. I agree. And they don't have that, and they didn't do it, but that will be a very interesting experience. Yeah. All right, thank you.